Um, I'm going to pace myself. We're not actually going to get to the decentralized IDs and just for a little time because we're waiting for somebody who's interested in that. But, so I've got plenty of other shit to talk about. So um, one of the things that interested me uh, in writing the Jasmine Wars was also just sort of the history of the world and how, how we tend to progress as a society, right? And what we, and what we tend to do is um, kill each other every you know, 50 or so years. And, uh, and, so, and, and we tend to go through these periods of centralization and decentralization. We've been doing it for a long time, right? When the pendulum swings too far in one direction, um, the society gets sick, right? And, and one of the things that I was thinking about is a society is healthy uh, when, when one group can't seize power over everyone else, right? When all of them sort of have to contend a little bit uh, and, uh, and, and, and none of them can fully get all the power. The, the mistake that people make is thinking that as long as if I could just wipe out the other guys, uh, everything would be great. Except uh, that's actually the exact opposite of how it works. Right? It's a delusion uh, that people have. Right? It's, no matter what your philosophy, you know, you're a socialist, you're a libertarian, you're a communist, whatever, you, people think, oh, if I could just get rid of the other guys, <laughs> everything would be this utopia. And what it would be is a freaking disaster. Okay? So it's actually better when everybody is a part of the system, and, and nobody can, everybody has to, everyone has to contend with the ideas, and the, and the best ideas rise to the top. Right? Um, and so the other thing that sort of inspired me was, when I was thinking about Cicada, was um, the Arab Spring. Uh, the Arab Spring was painful for me to watch, because uh, it quickly turned into the Arab Winter. And, and what happened was you have uh, you know, people basically rise up after there were... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have people. You have you have basically the, the the people rise up after essentially forty years of emergency rule. What a joke is this, right? That you have a dictator in power who creates. Uh, we've got we've got to have these emergency laws, and this is one of the jokes of, of, of dictators, right? They say, "Listen, I'm just going to need these powers for a little while, okay? Uh, everyone, just go ahead and uh, vote it in, and then I'm just I'm just going to turn it all all the power back over to you guys." <laughs> um, and then, and then, if people don't go along with it, then, then there's a there's a there's a dictator playbook, right? You basically you start rounding up the intellectuals, everybody in this room. Uh, you round up the artists. Uh, you start killing all the judges, the activists, etc. Uh, you know anybody who pops up and says, Gee, I don't know, <laughs> if this is a good idea. We're gonna have all the power and kill everybody, and then you go, let's kill that guy too. Right? So, um, and in fact, it, you know, I would I would encourage everyone actually. This isn't a fun expedition, but I would encourage everyone to go to the House of Terror uh, in Budapest, which is a history of communist, communist and Nazi rule in, in Hungary for, for many years. And uh, it's not, like I said, not a fun experience. <clears throat> but um, I think it's very important in life uh, to see life as it is, right? not as you imagine it to be. Right? Because if you don't understand how things actually work, then you can't actually create a system you know, that helps people. You create more delusion, right? And the thing about it is, the communists and the, and the fascists both have this idea that if they could just have all the power, everything would be fine, right? So they, they went through that classic dictator playbook. You, if you go to the House of Terror, uh, you can go down into the, the wonderful gallows in the bottom, and you can see what it's like to live the, uh, the, the end of your life in a cell. And we you know, read some spurious charges that they made up and hung. Right? So that, that's what happens when people get too much power. And so I thought, I really want to limit people's ability to do this in the future, right? And, and when you see what happens in the Arab Spring is they rise up and they throw off the dictatorship of this 40-year 40, 40 rule. And then, uh, you know, within you know, a year, they've got another uh, dictator, military <laughs> dictator in there, uh, with another 40 years of, of, of emergency rule to look forward to, right? We're seeing this in Turkey now, right? Oh, uh, well, we have this revolution, uh, which is over in 10 minutes. And uh, suddenly they rounded everyone up and they you know, stuffed the ballots and they've got this vote. Wonderful, right? Um, <coughs> and one of the problems was I thought people actually, uh, you know, they can't organize. They don't have the infrastructure to organize. So the, the people get very enthusiastic and uh, they go into the streets and they, they talk in this dictatorship and then everybody's very hopeful. And then unfortunately the only people who've been organized uh, during that time were, uh, in Egypt, for instance, were the Muslim Brotherhood. And they were organized because 
they were an underground terrorist organization for 30 years. And so it, uh, it turns out that a terrorist organization is actually very similar to any other organization, uh, in that you have to have uh, marketing people. <laughs> you just don't call them that. And you have to have chains of command, right? Command and all these things. And so when it came time to organize the different political parties, the various sort of liberal parties and, and uh, in, in a sort of classic liberal, liberal sense, right? That word has become poison because we love to poison words now. Um, they were looking for their marketing guy and their, their graphic designer. And they were going, oh, shit, what's our message? Uh, we got to get it together real quick. Unfortunately, Muslim Brotherhood really were the only ones who had their message together and they had their people that they could just repurpose. So they were able to get out to the street, they dominated the vote, and immediately set about doing uh, what insane people always do, which is, again, force all the power back into their hands, at which point the military rises up, throws them off, and we're back to square one. Right? So how do we stop this cycle from happening? Right? Uh, that's what I spent a lot of my time thinking about. And uh, to do that, you have to spend a lot of time thinking about how to destroy things, uh, because if you can't figure out how to destroy a system, then you cannot figure out how to protect a system, right? So it's important that when you're looking at code, when you're looking at how you design these systems, that you're thinking about all of the evil, malicious ways that it can be manipulated, right? Um, and so a good example is something like the Adahar system, which is a, a biometric system in India, centralized system, where they have, um, scanned every Indian's irises and all of their fingers. They turn that into a number and uh, through a proprietary algorithm by a lovely company called GenKey. And uh, that, of course, it's open and standard and secure. It's, we, you know, we can't expect it, so you'll just have to believe us. And uh, you know, that goes into a database somewhere, a nice centralized database. Uh, and, it's, it is, uh, and they've managed to supposedly enroll 99% of the population. It's probably a bullshit number. Uh, but let's say they've probably, you know, enrolled 80% of the people. It's still a feat, but it's a giant centralized thing, right? On the back end, they've stored all this information about people. And I, I've read through the papers, and they've, they've tried to design it in such a way, at least the tech guys did, uh, with the concept that they're not going to store all this data. It's just going to have the person's name, right, their, their, their gender, et cetera, and that the other systems that connect to it are only going to be one way, okay? But they're not going to collate all this data. <laughs> right? Except what happens is with a centralized system, it says it has a classical choke point, and that choke point is basically someone like, I don't know, uh, the guy they have in power now, Modi, who essentially can say, um, I've passed a law, and now you have to keep all that data. Okay? So everyone start collating all the data and make sure you know where everybody goes, everything that they do, everything they spend their money on, everything we can use to blackmail them later. Maybe some guy's going to the strip club at night, he's got a wife at home, we can use that later. Right? You know, maybe you say, well, you shouldn't be doing that. Maybe not. But at the same time, if we think about all the things that, the, the sort of mistakes that people make in life, right? you think about maybe all the things you did in college. Imagine if that shit lived forever, right? You know, maybe you smoked marijuana, or you got into trouble, you, maybe you shoplifted something, or whatever. You know, and now these things, potentially, can live forever, right? And we're going into a point in society where in the past, if you did these things, you know, they disappeared as you matured as an individual. Right? You grew up, you became a productive member of society, you, know, you got married, had kids, and you, know, you, you worked a job, right? Uh, and, and, and that, your little indiscretions and things like that are left behind. And we're, we're, we're going rapidly towards a world where it's going to be possible to data mine and understand all these correlations and use them against people very easily. And so, you know, these things are basically humanitarian disasters waiting to happen. Okay? Decentralization as a concept has a lot of power to undo some of these things if, this is a huge if, if we are careful and smart enough, right? Because it's entirely possible that we screw it up too and, and, and give the world, you know, an evil thing <laughs> by mistake, right? So we have to be very careful in terms of how we design these things at every step of the pass, right? So that we can get to a point that we're, not, that we're contributing something valuable to humanity, right? Um, and so, how much uh, So, the, 
the, these types of things are obviously incredibly challenging. And the other thing that's incredibly challenging is when, when, when I started thinking about a system, I, I would lay down all of the ideas that I had, and many of them are in opposition to each other, okay? They're paradoxical. I'd like to create, for instance, an ID that also gives people privacy, right? A unique ID, but there's also privacy, right? I'd like to have open communication, but I'd also like to have private communication, right? And so what happens is most people put down all these principles, <clears throat> then they think about it for 10 minutes and they go, ah, that doesn't, I don't think that's possible. And, uh, and then they go, okay, cool. What I'm going to start doing is making a lot of compromises, right? And uh, I'm just, you know what, I'm just going to have this little central system over here. We'll get rid of that later. It's no problem. And then, you know, we'll just, well, we'll have this other central system here. It'll be no problem. And of course, later on, they're just, they're still there and it's a problem. And so what I encourage people to do is take on the mindset of that there is actually nothing that is impossible, except maybe flapping your arms and flying to the moon or something, right? But most of these problems are just a matter of changing your mindset and understanding that the problem is solvable, even if you can't think of it right away, right? And so, and, and, that, and when you design the system, you lay down clearly what all the principles are, and you say, I will not accept a system that does not meet all of these criteria. In other words, I come up with a great idea of how to implement this in code or whatever, and then I go, Okay, it, it meets five of the six criteria. That's a failure. That gets thrown out until it meets the six criteria. The six criteria may be the hardest piece. That may be the piece that is almost impossible to do, and people will laugh at you and say, you can't do this. Right? It's impossible to do. Uh, but that's exactly the piece that, that you really need to solve right? in, order to create, in, in order to create progress right? and, and get to a place where you can solve things. And the other thing is, once you create that mentality, you can actually go about solving these problems. So there's this old cliche that, you know, whether you believe that you can or you can't, right, it, you know, it's true. Now, I used to think that was some mystical mumbo jumbo bullshit uh, made up by hippies, but, but it's actually literally true, okay? Like, if, if, when you start off with this premise of, oh, I'm sorry, that can't be done, but guess what? It's all over. It cannot be done because you don't even start. Right? Okay? So it's interesting that Fermat's gone, but it's interesting that Fermat was chosen, right, as, uh, as the name, right? And I don't know if anybody knows the history of Fermat, but uh, some people do in the room, but it's a, it's a famous math problem. It almost started off as kind of like a cosmic joke, in that you had this famous mathematician, and he had this magazine that he got delivered with mathematical nerds of the time, right? And he wrote this equation in the in the page, like he was just, you know, watching, like we'd be watching the news or playing on our iPad, and he wrote down this thing. And he, and he also wrote a little note saying, I've, I've got the proof for this, there's just no room in the column here, so, you know, I'll just do it later. And so everybody, they found this thing, and oh, this is a great equation. Um, and, uh, and then they started looking around, and they can't find the proof anywhere. And then they go through all his papers, he dies, and there's, they can't find the proof. And so, um, they go, he said it was a simple thing, we'll just start working on this. So, for 300 years, people started working on this, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it turns out that actually the proof was created in uh, 2008, 2009, after set, six years of work, published it, there was a flaw in the proof, and so it took another year. And uh, so seven years of a man's life. And uh, what's interesting is that the proof is uh, 125 pages. Uh, so. <laughs> So either they didn't get his simple proof, and that's still waiting, uh, or he was lying and it was a joke, or he was such a genius that we'll never ever be able to figure it out. But what was interesting is as people worked on this problem over the years, it was responsible for tiny leaps in progress, right? So whole branches of mathematics, uh, sort of uh, parts of like linear algebra and things like that that are sort of powering modern technologies like artificial intelligence, whatever, all these types of things developed as people were trying to figure out this freaking proof, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is how, you know, as, as we work on these things, uh, you know, we, we might just push the ball a little bit forward, right? Maybe I only, maybe I have this grand vision for solving all the problems in the world and maybe I only get to solve the ID problem you know, before the universe wipes me out and, and gives the problem to somebody else, right? Uh, but through that process, right, is how, is how we progress you know, as a society, right? Um, 
So believing that something is possible is the first step, and then laying out your criteria, and then going through it. And then once you've, once you've solved it, it, this amazing thing happens, right? Other people go, shit, I get, it can be solved, right? So they always, in these, these self-help seminars, they always talk about, oh, you know, Roger Bannister breaking the four-minute mile, right? And they, they kind of cheat a little bit uh, because they, they always say, well, we thought it was physically impossible to run the four-minute mile. That's bullshit. They actually knew it was possible. It's just nobody had ever done it. Uh, nobody could run a mile in four minutes. Um, and a funny thing happened. Uh, people were getting close to, close to it, and, and Bannister finally breaks it, and then two other people break it within like a couple of months. Okay? And that's the funniest thing, and we're seeing a lot of this now with the blockchain, right? Satoshi essentially uh, solves the problem of, uh, what is it, Zuku's Triangle. Zuku's Triangle says that there are three, th there's, there's three points on the triangle that says it's impossible to have a system that's uh, you know, basically human readable and decentralized and secure. You can get two of these principles, but not three, okay? So Bitcoin was one of the first things to prove that that's not correct, there is, there, that there is a system that solves this problem. But one of the challenges, though, is that it creates what I call the Satoshi box, okay? So that is, this genius comes along, and he solves this problem, and he moves the problem over here, and he goes, ah, the new box, this is the only way to do it. <laughs> We're just gonna copy this shit endlessly, right? So that's what the fuck is happening right now in cryptocurrency. Every, every cryptocurrency, including Ethereum, sorry guys, and everything else is essentially a clone of this stuff, right? With a couple of tweaks on it, right? Uh, if, even PIMX and all these things, they add a little bit to the concept, and it might m move it incrementally, but it's essentially all based on the same thing. Now the interesting thing is that blockchains can solve, and decentralized systems can solve a lot more problems, and we're actually only at the beginning of a movement uh, of how that's going to work. And uh, we're basically the cavemen in this situation. They just everybody just said, and uh, we're, we're the cavemen in this situation. And here's how I know this. Okay, the blockchain is an example of triple entry accounting. Now, I'm going to go into the history of accounting. This is a riveting subject, okay? The history of accounting is actually uh, something that very few people know because accounting is freaking boring, right? Um, but it's actually incredibly important in the history of the world. There's actually only been two different breakthroughs in accounting in the history of man until Bitcoin, right? Until triple entry accounting. And, and the first one you had single entry accounting. And what it was is all the rich people had all the money, basically the kings and queens, and they had dukes and such. And uh, you, you put one entry in the ledger. This guy owes me 50 fucking bucks, right? <laughs> and so the accountant was your brother. Uh, and he was your brother because you, got, you had to trust that guy. You know why you had to trust that guy? Because if he says, no, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> there's no record anymore of that $50. <laughs> so homeboy can be going over to the treasury, filling his pockets. Walking out the door and erasing all that shit from the ledger. Okay, so what happened was uh, that's how you know, we think we have this one percent problem now. It's a joke compared to the one percent problem in the history of the world, right? When all the kings and queens had the money, uh, and then even you know even up to a hundred years ago, you know, all the feudal lords in China, you know, they were talking about like twenty guys had all the cash, and uh, and then they could kill you if you you stole a loaf of bread or something for your family. So that's when we actually had a one percent problem. Uh, we've made some progress since then. I think we got about 30,000 people with the money. So we can go further. So around the, the time of the uh, uh, 15, late 1500s, Viennese traders, okay, they start wanting to trade with people that they don't know. Okay? So instead of it being like, hey, I'm the king, and Tejas, you're my brother, we're going to trade. Now I'm going to trade with Julian. I don't know his ass from anybody. Right? And so now we have to have proof that we've traded money. And so they come up with the double entry accounting system, which is I have a debit, I paid you something, and you have a credit. Then we both have a receipt that says I bought something in Julian, right? And now all of a sudden, every time this has happened, it presages a massive uptick in complexity. Actually, even single entry accounting was a massive uptick because before that, we were all just running around in tribes, you know? and hanging out and checking out the moon and saying like, 
the sky has told me that we're going to migrate over here and there'll be the buffalo. Right? And people did that for you know, a million years. Then the kings and queens come along and they go, we've got this thing, it's called violence, we'll take over everything and, uh, and we'll get all the money. And then we'll create this single entry accounting. But it's more complex than it was. They can build castles and shit like that, you know, it's pretty advanced, but nah, you know, it's not a great place to live, right? You know, just watch Game of Thrones, really fucked up. So then, <laughs> um, so you get this double entry accounting, all of a sudden, now you've got shit moving around the world. They've got, they got ships, they're bringing, they got globalism. I know globalism's this evil thing now, if, you know, if fucking psychopaths come to power, but um, it's, it's actually very interesting to be able to move shit all around the world, right? If I, you know, suddenly I can get, Paprika from Hungary. Right? Maybe I don't have paprika at all. Paprika's pretty good. Right? I'd like to have paprika. So they gotta bring it on a ship to me, and I gotta pay somebody for it, but we both gotta have proof that I paid for it. Right? So double entry accounting. We actually still use double entry accounting today, and if you're doing it like TurboTax and do your taxes or QuickBooks, right? You're just using a double entry accounting system. But it's starting to strain at the seams. Society is starting to strain at the seams. And so are these accounting systems. And so along comes triple entry accounting. What is triple entry accounting? Well, it's just what it sounds, sounds like. And, and now I can make a prediction, by the way, that there will be quadruple entry accounting. I have no idea what that looks like, but it'll probably be really important. So if it comes along in your lifetime, invest in that. But hey, triple entry accounting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. We're, we're, we're going to make a third entry. So I have it in a credit. And then we got this thing called this blockchain. I'm going to put the, uh, an entry in there. And what is that? That is. Yeah, all of us agreeing on a version of objective reality, okay? It is not actual objective reality, which we could get into a philosophical hole here, but uh, so we won't, but because uh, there, maybe there is no objective reality or we can't actually get to it, but let's pretend that we've outlined objective reality. And now we have this sort of immutable, immutable thing. Now, what, what can you do with that, right? Because that's the important thing. So imagine now that you have stock issued in a company, right? And uh, this company is called Enron, for instance, right? And um, in a double entry accounting system, you go, look, well, I'm giving you two million shares, because you got, yeah, you got awesome green hair. Grant. Grant. <laughs> I, I like your beard, million shares, okay? Enron blowing up like nitro, everybody's excited. Everybody's making fun of me. I got, you're like, I got a million shares. So I'm, go, you know, I'm, going, I'm going on a cruise. I'm buying a $10 million place, right? This is awesome. All of a sudden it turns out, actually, you don't have 10 million shares. <laughs> we basically just made those up. And, uh, and the problem is you don't actually get access to the books because it's a security issue in the double entry economy. I have these behind the corporate fire, right? And so you don't actually know whether you've got million shares. I gave you a piece of paper. It's got a stamp on it. It's real official, right? So, you got 10 million shares, right? Here you go. You got the <laughs> Except you have really no idea. But in a triple entry accounting system, you do. Because all those shares would be listed. You know, there's 10 million shares. And I could go and look, and they say, look, you've got 10% of the shares. And I go, cool, I'm going to check that against the third entry. Oh, well, I've got, my math's terrible. I've got 5,000 of whatever, so I've got 10%. I actually know that I have 10%. Right, so these are the types of things is what we've been doing is just we've been, we've been playing with funny money. Right? That's the, the cryptocurrencies, right? It's cool, cool funny money. And uh, we're trying to make money cooler, and, and that's, one of, that's the only problem we've actually solved. And then we tried to kind of like retrofit this concept right, into, uh, into building an app platform. And then there's this kind of libertarian crypto nerd fantasy where, um, where essentially we're going to have microtransactions for everything. And this is really nothing but a, but a fantasy, right? There will be microtransactions for stuff. And microtransactions will be very cool. But a lot of these things are actually just going to be free in the real world. And nobody's going to pay shit for these. So what we want to get to is a point, and this is what Fairmark can kind of get us to, is we want to have an, an app platform first, cryptocurrency second. And the app platform allows you to do a bunch of stuff that kind of looks like all the shit you're doing right now, right? Oh, I got a chat. It's just decentralized and more secure. I got stickers to send to my wife. And then maybe I'm going to upgrade to the microtransaction sticker so I can get more cats. See what I mean? Now I might use a microtransaction okay, to get my 
I, want, I really want the, the sticker with the waving cat. You see what I mean? So, so we, want, we want to design something that sort of mirrors the real world. And we can also do a lot of other things that people are just not thinking about, which I don't know why, uh, but I was thinking about that. And that is, uh, we, could, we could likely create secure, uh, transparent voting systems. Now, a lot of people in power are not going to like that. <laughs> so real happy about having these obscure voting systems. In fact, we just had this awesome uh, referendum in Turkey, and I was reading about it in the Wall Street Journal, where you know the, all the votes are supposed to get this stamp. It says that they're sort of official. And uh, a couple of people started to notice this weird thing. They were, all these ones were coming in without stamps from overseas. And, uh, and they, you know, the guy who's monitoring it just goes, you know, I think we have a problem here. What are we going to do? And uh, so wheels of bureaucracy turn in the background. You know, he waits. 45 minutes go by, and gets the call, count all those votes. <laughs> count those two million fucking made up votes. That's all. <coughs> they basically just said, I oh, know how we win this shit. By the way, they won 51 to 49%. Surprise! <laughs> they did everything possible to make it possible to win. They did not allow the opposition to get on the news. They dominated the news cycle 90% of the time. They killed people. They threw people in jail. Um, they arrested anyone who didn't agree with them or spoke up. And then they stuffed about 2 million ballots. Okay? So, and why can they do that? It's because there ain't no third entry. We don't know how many votes there are actually, how many people are registered to vote, and we don't know whether they've cast their vote. But a decentralized blockchain system, or even just actually probably a centralized blockchain system, although in some respects it would be more attackable, would be a super added advantage to a voting system. Right? Because you know how many votes were cast, when they were cast, and hell, you know in real time who the hell was winning. You wouldn't be waiting on election night going, I wonder who won. Did Trump take over? Fuck, I gotta leave the country. I mean, we're gonna... <laughs> we're gonna... Hillary win, fuck, I gotta leave the country. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> that, there's, there's all this potential in blockchain, <coughs> and we've been screwing around with this monkey problem of, of moving cash around. It's a great problem. And actually, I, I was, you know, I'm super excited to kind of jump into the PIVX forum, and, and I've been, I started off trading, um, doing arbitrage and the early exchanges. Now, if anybody knows anything about arbitrage, essentially what you do is you buy money on one exchange and then you flip it immediately on another exchange. Now in the real world, uh, really, really hard, right? Because these markets are super efficient and the difference in exchanges might be like a fraction of a cent. But because like Bitcoin in the early days was just this weird thing that nobody quite understood, you get these like three to five cent swings. So if you imagine you go out and you're like, I'll just buy a thousand of these suckers and then I'll flip them over here, you're making five cents every time. Unfortunately it was, um, a little chaotic. You had this little problem with exchanges, you know, just disappearing, uh, stealing all your money, uh, just crashing for two hours, and like, they, you know, we get their money out, right? So we lost this, about half of the money, uh, and you know, we made some, we made some other money. I also bought a couple of, you know, miners from China, great pieces of equipment until they just busted, right? And uh, then I called support, said hello, yeah, your, your ASIC is fucking broken. They said, sir, uh, no money back, sorry. You know, that's right. Well, can, can I get this fixed? No, no. So uh, that, was, that was, you know, big, big waste of time. Um, so I kind of sat out for a little while, right? And I was just sort of noodling around with the Cicada project in my head, not really paying too much attention. So I come back, we start talking about and I'm excited to see kind of the stuff that, that you've been working on, you know, secretly. And then I kind of jump into Pivx, and I see sort of like this whole community of people kind of interacting. And I see that tip bot, right? And that tip bot was like, and hey, this is cool, right? I got a command line where I can just send money around. So I was like, I'm sending money. I'm impersonating the human CI saying, send me your ties. Give me all the money, right? Um, and it's cool. Like, the money's moving around in this frictionless fashion, right? So a lot of progress is happening in different areas. One of the best things we can do is really form an umbrella organization. It's one of the things that I'm working on. Try to be an evangelist since I build my sort of personal brand. People know who the hell I am. Um, for some reason, they like to hear me talk, and, uh, and and they like what I write. So I want to say, look, all these projects that are out there, come into the boat. 
come here, right? We're all working on this problem, right? Let's work on various aspects of this problem together. Because each person is sort of, like you said, working on this massive piece of this giant freaking puzzle, right? It's a, it is a big puzzle, and it's really complicated, right? And you get a number of people go, yeah, if we could just have this. And then another person goes, we could just have this. And if we could just have this. Well, of course, we could have all that, it'd be freaking great. But we've got to do it all. And unfortunately, we have this little thing, it's called time, and uh, it kind of slows everything down, right? And then you have this thing working together. Uh, that's also a problem, where you got to kind of get everyone going in the same direction. Herding cats. Okay, everybody, we're going here. Like we were trying to get dinner the other night. <laughs> it's like to 18 people. I thought it was going to be four, and it's 18 people. And then we call, well, we, we can only get 12. So the other, you know, the other people got to go somewhere else. But then dude, somebody only has an uh, opening in May. Right? So then we find, you know, finally we get a place. So 12 people is there. We've all gone in the same direction. We were supposed to go out at 8.30. I think we got there at 9.45. Uh, so that's, you know, the thing is all, things always take longer than you want. So I encourage everyone to have patience. Now, did the person who wants to hear about biometrics and shit show up? Yes. Okay. So I can talk about the decentralized idea. So when I was trying to use data, I wasn't thinking about a cryptocurrency. I was thinking about how do I create a voting system and how the hell do I create a representative list government? Because you have these little problem of people are dumb and bored. Uh, they get bored easily, right? So how do you create something that kind of keeps people interested in participating in their, in their democracy? Because they barely participate in the one where, where somebody is elected and goes and does shit, right? And then also you have to have one man or woman and one vote, right? Um, and to do that, I realized I needed to create uh, an ID system, a biometric ID system, or what I call a human unique identifier. I also wanted to make sure that I wouldn't have the uh, Indian Anahar problem, where you basically create this system uh, that allows you to be tracked in pretty much everything you do in your life, right? Because this is, you know, potentially a huge nightmare for humanity. Um, so I don't want to get into all of the technical details. I'm happy to sit down with anyone who's like really into all the technical details. I'll just I'll lose half of my audience, or actually 75% of it. But the main concept is that um, you use. I, I thought your iris scan, because it's uh, for, for numerous technological reasons, where you basically create a public-private key pair, right, in a decentralized fashion. And uh, there are a number of sort of mechanisms in there that will allow you to do this. Some people think this is impossible, so I wrote a second white paper to prove them wrong. And um, I'll probably have to write more on this concept, but the main concept is people think you can only have a centralized ID. In other words, only if an authority comes and says, uh, you are an official person. I've decided, right? Um, you, you now have my stamp of approval that that's the only thing that can work. But actually, you know, what I've sort of discovered is centralized IDs have the same sort of level of problems of, of fraud and everything else. And it, it, they have sort of a strong creation, but a weak control on the output, right? So one of the things I thought is you can create a number of systems to kind of govern creating the decentralized ID. But then you also need this thing on the other side to help kind of control it. Right? And that's sort of what we call a reputation system. Now, when I say a reputation system, most people immediately start thinking of like voting on restaurants or like Uber, right? The guy drove me somewhere and we both kind of vote for each other. And that, that, that system is kind of a basic level reputation system. Because what happens on Uber? If anyone's lower than 4.6, it, it's, it's like being rated at 1. So essentially, like they created this 5 point scale that's useless. Because it really only goes from four, six to five, or, and then you're, you're a pariah, and nobody wants to get in your car. And why does that happen? Because they go, well, we both got out of the car. I didn't really like this guy. I mean, he didn't really like me, but you know, we're both looking at each other. We go, how are you, you know, like, how, we're both thinking, how are you going to vote? <laughs> I better defensively vote this motherfucker a five, right? <laughs> because I want him to vote five for me. So then everybody's five stars, or 4.6 stars, and you have something that's worthless, right? So, so what, I, what I started thinking is you've got to have a, a reputation at all layers of the system that's algorithmic, and that that one aspect where you're reading people only has uh, use in, in certain things, like when you're interacting with a business. You know, so a good example is if I have different nodes on the network, and uh, we just start, you know, Matthias and I start talking, just by interacting on the network, connecting with new people, that's sort of a positive 
vote on the reputation. If a bunch of people say this guy's you know, a scumbag troll and they start sort of saying no, cutting me off and blocking me, that's sort of a hit to my reputation. Right? But, but we're not voting, I really like you guys, I do. But uh, we're not voting to say that, it's just we're interacting. So it's sort of like a Turing test to say, are you using the idea in the world over time? Or are you a real person, right? And in additional things, you put things at like the networking level, the reputation system at the networking level. So essentially, you have two nodes talking to each other, and one of them starts doing malicious stuff. Right? It starts sending screwed up packets to the other machine. You're going to get a little technical here, so everybody can just, your eyes can glaze over if you don't understand. And uh, you know, I'm trying to see, is it, doing, is it violating my rules? So you have a, a blockchain storing a set of rules of what you're supposed to be able to do on the network and not. And it's testing. You know, are you running the latest rule sets? And can you prove that you are? If not, we got a problem. Hit it in your reputation. You're doing this sort of malicious stuff, hit on the reputation. The system might vote, hey, this, this, this node keeps sending me crap. It keeps violating the rules. Vote. And other nodes might vote to a blockchain. And essentially, that node might get blacklisted for a period of time. Maybe it, it, it might be five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, right? It might escalate over time, right? So all this is happening an algorithmic layer, and you're basically updating the rules as people learn to exploit them, because people are really good at exploiting rules. And so you continually kind of update these rules over time. Right? And then also what you have is reputation in terms of weight. So this is a little like proof of stake. There are all the crypto nerds out there. And uh, proof of stake is a bit like, but not totally. Weight is more like, I'm an organization, okay? a company, and I'm hiring you know, Guillermo, and Guillermo's got his ID. And he's, I'm not just going to hire a sock puppet who made up their ID. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interview Guillermo and see if he's a real person, if he knows what the hell he's talking about, and look at his resume. Oh, so what am I doing? I'm, I'm Turing testing. Is he, is he bot? Is he real? Right, he's going to fly out. He's going to show up in my office. Unless they've developed Android technology, he's probably a real person. Right? So, and at that point, I now hire him, and through his ID, I'm giving him now access to, imagine this in the future, a VPN stock shares on the blockchain, access to the documents behind the firewall, et cetera, with this ID, right? I've now given role-based access control to my company with his ID in the real world, right? And now I put my weight behind it. I say, Guillermo seems to be a real person. He's working for me now, right? And so that raises his trust level. And it allows him to do different things on the network, right? And that basically allows you to interact at different levels. And is it, is it a perfect system? There is no perfect system. Get that out of your mind. So what you want to do is build something that is, is works 99% you know, of the time. You want, to be, you want to understand that there's going to be kind of outliers, right, or screw-ups. And then you want to adjust for those things. And you also want to assume that there's always going to be hostile actors in the system. And you'll never be able to get rid of them. That's another part of the dictator playbook. We're going to eliminate all the enemies of the people. Unfortunately, there just turns out to be a lot of enemies of the people, so you've got to keep eliminating people. Um, so we don't want to do that. Right? We, we want to get to the point where uh, you're going to assume that there's going to be people who don't want to participate in the system. They want to try to cheat it. Right? Whether it's, you know, it's, it's part of our game philosophy. So you want, to, you want to know how those things are happening. And the, and the reputation system is a... So the idea, as I design it, really, is an inversion of the centralized system. And that is we have strong controls on the centralized ID creation, and weak controls on the usage of the ID. That's why there's like, there's fraud all the time. You know, my sister's, my sister's identity got stolen, and they go, we got you. We're going to put an alert on the cards. Every time this guy goes and uses your ID to open up cards, you're going to get an alert. Except, you know, he just keeps opening stuff. It's a brute force attack. And sometimes they forget to call. Oh, so maybe he gets five grand, and then they got to return it, right? And then eventually he gets bored and moves on to stealing someone else's stuff. So we have this kind of rampant fraud. Right? Um, and so this reverses the concept where essentially you have slightly weaker controls on the creation, strong controls on the usage, which I feel is a superior system because that's where you're using it most of the time. Creation is five seconds, using it is the rest of your life. So that's where you kind of want to put your efforts. Right? And in addition, um, I looked back over a lot of research as I was working on this. And I found, um, for instance, uh, David Chom, who's a famous cryptographer. He'd already essentially figured out a lot of this shit in the 1980s. He even figured out something like this, cell phone. He called it a card computer. It didn't exist. Um, 
And he essentially had this concept that you could have these sub-IDs. Okay? And these sub-IDs might essentially uh, only contain a little bit of your information. Right? You might say, okay, I've got my credit card and my name. And so imagine that in the future, I go to like an eBay and I give them my sub-ID token. Okay? And they're just storing this sub-ID token or they're storing the rights to access that information in an information wallet. Instead of just a money wallet, now, now I'm storing my personal information here instead of putting it on these centralized databases because they do a great job of security. I don't know if you've seen maybe any of these breaches uh, that happen, but if you kind of look around, there's probably a, like a giant breach uh, every other day of a major company's information. In fact, it's actually likely um, that there's uh, one in seven people, somebody else has your social security number if you're in America. Uh, there are multiple people, I think, five to 10 million, where uh, at least three people have their social security number, which is awesome. <laughs> really, work, that, that works great. And, so, and then all of a sudden you get this, this notification that we've broken into this centralized system. And of course, why wouldn't you break into the centralized system? There's the old aphorism that, uh, why rob a man on the street when I can go rob a fucking bank? They've got all the money. I don't want to rob Guillermo in line. I'm going to get 30 bucks. Right? I can go rob the bank. I get a minute. So it's the same thing with IDs. They go rob all of this information. And now I can use that for identity fraud to spin up 10 million other IDs, go hack somebody else. See? So the idea is you invert that on its head, too. So now I'm giving them this token. They know just enough about me to do business with me. And at some point in time, if I don't want them to have access to my information, which is stored with me, I delete it and they don't have access anymore and they're not selling my data, right? And so I, I control it. And now they've got to go attack all of us individually. Now, well, that's great. I'll, I'll just, I'm going to write some malware and go after these guys. So again, this is where I try to think of security at multiple layers. And I also try to think, how do I use the tools of evil against evil? Right? I'm a big fan of studying the techniques of evil. I watch a lot of Donald Trump speeches. And um, <laughs> you know, what he uses is repetition. You know? What he uses is repetition. Um, and so you really want to repeat things again and again. And you want to use visual imagery, uh, like those people are snakes. And uh, you want that to stick in someone's mind, that they're snakes. Right? And so I try to use the tools of evil for good. And so one of the things I think about is how do malware writers kind of do things? And we talked a little about one of the developers. We talked about this, the uh, developer uh, You know, How do malware writers do the things that they do? So I noticed that uh, several malware writers got really creative. In fact, malware is an industry. It's actually like an underground industry where there are entire gangs who have whole coder teams, much bigger than freaking Fermat, uh, writing viruses. Uh, to steal your information. They have scrum teams, they have release cycles. I'm not shitting you, okay? And, uh, and this happens all the time. And so then they also got really smart. Uh, they knew that there were these things uh, called antivirus companies, and that these antivirus companies would be trying to isolate the virus so that they could study it and you know, tear it apart and create a definition for it. And so these virus got, writers got smart, and they started creating these rules. They started encrypting the virus, and a little bit of the virus would start up, and it would morph into a different shape, so it was harder to track down. And they would check out and talk to these command and control servers, like, hey, can I get to the network? Am I running in a virtual machine? Because I want to know whether I'm trying to be isolated. And you know, can I talk to the command and control servers? If I can't do any of these things, die. If I can't do these things, it's money time, right? Now I can download my new rule sets, and I can start attacking this sucker and stealing all of his information and taking over his computer. So I thought, you know, shit, why can't we do that with the blockchain too? Why can't I have a series of rules for good, you know, intrusion detection, but antivirus, those, type, those types of rules, essentially, so when your application on your phone starts up for the first time, it's going, hey, am I running the correct version? Am I running the latest version? What are the rules? Do I have access to the network? If not, don't start. Right? So we need to add security at that level too. Right? Now, whether I always have the perfect details or not is actually relevant, right? There's always some type of implementation that can be done. What I am confident of is something that I call a meta pattern, okay? Meta patterns are something that has really influenced my thinking. There is a, a book that I read, you can still get it on uh, Dead Trees, aka books, but you can't get it on Kindle. Uh, it was from a professor at my university, uh, New York University, 
the Tyler Vogue, and it's called that a pattern. And this guy figured out a pattern in freaking everything, right? He, he looked at, he tried to break it down to the most basic level. So for instance, a two is really useful for a number of things. And it has weaknesses in certain things. A tube is a tunnel. You can go from here to here, I can make a train. Right? Or I can make a wire, makes electricity go from here to here. That's a tube. Right? A sphere has certain principles. It's really hard to get a grip on. Right? It has less drag. Right? Uh, society in many ways is a sphere. And how we sort of form these, how we form these things. So when I look at the world, and I, I look at designing systems, I'm looking at meta patterns. I'm looking at nature. How does nature do this? You know, DNA is an amazing example of technology. You maybe don't think of it as technology, but it is. It's biotechnology. And every one of your cells is a copy of your data, <coughs> perfect copy of your data. You can lose millions of cells, <coughs> and your body's like, hey, no problem. I got another copy. Okay? I mean, it's, it is massively redundant, massively parallel. Now, there are some improvements that we could work on. Right? If I lose this arm, maybe we go and, and get the thing from the, from the, you know, the lizards that can regenerate. That would be pretty awesome. We could slice that DNA in there. Right? But again, all of these systems, I look to nature to try to understand it. And I look to how we do things in the real world. Right? And so what I'm saying is take <coughs> inspiration from things that are not necessarily in technology. Right? When you're designing a piece of technology, don't just say, well, What's the best practice? Oh, shit, I looked this up. So O'Reilly book, this guy told me everything I need to know. I'm just going to copy his shit. Oh, it's on GitHub. I'm just going to fork it. It's done. Okay? Uh, that's a really lazy-ass way of doing shit. Right? It, it, it might be useful, because sometimes it's not worth reinventing the wheel. And maybe there is, over time, a best practice that's developed. But also, I want people to think harder. What I call, you know, what I, my favorite thing in the world, everyone where I work last at Dan's favorite phrase is critical thinking. Critical thinking is how I get out of doing stupid shit I don't want to do. It's also how I get people to ask themselves, why the hell are you doing this this way? And the answer, surprisingly most of the time, is I have no freaking idea. Or somebody told me to do it. Or somebody thought this was a good idea. For instance, a great example is like cold calling people. Okay, they love this idea in sales. We're gonna get every, we're gonna have a cold calling marathon on everybody. We're gonna get we're gonna get all the drones in a room, you're gonna pound the horns for three hours. We're gonna make a million dollars. No, you're not, you're gonna annoy a bunch of people and you're gonna have a 0.5% success rate. It's such a piece of shit system. And people just do these types of things over and over again because they don't think about it. They don't take inspiration from other places in life. Right? So everything that you learn in life. Your education is what you were exposed to. That's what my greatest mentor always told me. High school English teacher, still, my, still one of my good friends, still see him every time, that I, every chance that I get it, okay? What you are exposed to teaches you more things. In every area of life, we used to be more interdisciplinary thinkers. We used to learn how to paint and play the piano, and now we go, oh, that's stupid. I'm just gonna learn how to like code, right? But the problem is we've we become so narrow. And so I encourage everyone to look and learn as much as possible information outside of your normal sphere of knowledge, right? And then apply the things that you see and develop the ability to see clearly what is actually in front of you. You'd be surprised at how few people are able to actually look at something and say that that's actually what's happening. They imagine something is happening in their mind, but it's not actually there. You know, and people believe all kinds of crazy shit. And, and, you, and, they're, and they're not looking at how reality is. But if you're going to design a system with that in mind, you're going to create a system that doesn't work. For example, if you don't believe that you, know, you uh, are going to die if you get hit by a car, uh, and you walk out into the street to try to prove that, you'll be proven wrong. Right? But you are free to believe that, right? which is insane. It's the definition of insanity is not actually looking at reality the way that it is. Right? Look at reality the way that it is. Study as much as possible. Look for bigger patterns. Bring that knowledge into what you're doing. And maybe, just maybe, we create a system that saves the fucking world instead of destroys it. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat>
uh, pose as me afterwards to another policeman. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so what you're talking about is, is the violence hack, and the, it's what I call, there's always one hack in the system, and uh, there's, a great, there's a great comic on this from uh, XED where uh, it's like the, the crypto nerd's version of reality, right? He's got, his, he's got his laptop, he's like, and they steal his laptop, and they're like, my God, it's encrypted with a four trillion bit encryption, we'll never break this. Get a supercomputer. Spend a million dollars to break his encryption. Right? And then the other side of the panel says, we got to take this $5 hammer and hit that son of a bitch over the fucking head until he gives you the password. <laughs> so, so, so that is actually how it works in life. That is the most, you, you pointed out, the absolute most difficult uh, problem to solve. It's actually not solvable in almost any system that I am aware of. One of the things that I did think about doing was creating a, um, a, both a password for, a, um, for distress. So two types of passwords. Essentially that I, I, I'm, somebody's like going to my head, give me your thing, you go, fine, here it is, here's my password. They go, sweet, start working on a bunch of transactions. And at one point in time, you know, you are able to go through a process that essentially says, I am out of danger right now, roll back all that shit. Now, uh, potentially that can be used for fraud, um, and I'm thinking about all the ways to destroy that as well, right? Um, so, but that's one of the hacks that I've been thinking about. It's, it's still evolving in my thinking, and again, it's because nobody's ever solved the problem in reality, so I'm trying to solve another unsolvable problem. <laughs> um, but it's, it's an important one, uh, and it's one that I think is worth solving. Uh, because it's dangerous. Now, one of the things I have solved is if somebody steals your identity, not necessarily through violence, is uh, you could essentially have a proof of stakes uh, uh, third party system or, a, or a, a court system. And you go, look, my ID has been stolen. And there's basically a, a dual key authentication system where you go and you say, look, I, I actually have proof that the ID is mine. Here's my eye. You go ahead and scan me. Oh, you actually do own this eye because it's based on the biometric, right? And you go, okay, the court system uses its weight and you use your weight, and you go boom, and it's now flagged the old ID as dirty in the blockchain, and it's essentially allowed you to go through the reset protocol, again, which is all automated, and you're able to put a new ID into the system and go forward from there, right? So it freezes the old transactions. So potentially, that's why I'm looking to sort of solve those problems, and I'm still trying to solve the violence hack. Another question? Yes, sir? Yeah, actually, you just answered this question a couple of minutes ago. Okay. And I was really surprised to hear the name David Chum from someone else. So <laughs> the Chum Patterson protocol is exactly for this problem. Okay. The mafia attack in the uh, Chum Patterson protocol is only uh, vulnerable to the violence hack right. in the middle of authentication, not after it or before it. And right. that's much harder. So yeah, cool. it is actually so then Beautiful. We're going to steal from the past. That's one of the best things in the world, right? It's, and that's the thing is, a lot of these ideas actually, and this is the thing, I encourage people to study widely, because a lot of people have written stuff in this sort of dry, boring language a bunch of years ago, and the truth is nobody cared about it, right? So it's sitting out there. It's just like when I started writing about Sakane, I thought, who's going to give a shit about this, right? Um, and there, there were a lot of people that that actually proved to be true. They wrote about a bunch of stuff, and it's brilliant, right? And you dig this stuff out. And, and, we're, and I'm into artificial intelligence now, and one of the things is, they're pulling out all these ideas from the 80s and 90s. And, the, and these guys were writing about it back then. They knew that the math worked, but they didn't have the processing power or the data to make it work. And so they couldn't prove it to people. And it's Jeffrey Hinton, who's one of the founders of, of artificial intelligence studies. Since that was, I know that this works, but I actually can't tell you. Not a very compelling argument. Uh, and so these guys were basically pariahs for a number of years. And, uh, and so, but now they're pulling all these old things out. And so a lot of this stuff is, you look back to the past for inspiration as well. Right? There's a bunch of stuff out there, and then you think, how can I use it now? Even Bitcoin was built on several ideas. In fact, the, the proof of work system was actually an attempt to solve spam. And the idea was that if I send you email, that I have to do a little proof of work right, to, to send you that mail so that I can't just hammer you with lots of stuff because it was frictionless. right? I just keep sending you a bunch of mail. So it was like designed to like make it harder and slow it down. It didn't really work for spam. Luckily, we came up with some other answers to it. But again, that problem made progress in other parts of the world. And look, it's not even about creating a cryptocurrency. It was trying to solve a spam problem. But look, somebody was smart enough to look, Satoshi, whether that was a person or multiple people, look at it and take that into their domain. Other questions? Yes? I don't really understand the basics. I read your uh, my paper. Yeah. Uh, Which one? 
I think the newer one, I couldn't find the old one. I read the okay. old one back a while ago, but okay. is it still up? Somewhere? It's still there, it's all on the GitHub, yeah. Got it. Uh, so I don't understand the basics of the generation. What stops someone uh, from, uh, so my iris is the source of everything, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So what stops someone to take a snapshot of my iris and then create an ID which is a, so he acts as me. Yeah, so, uh, so, so. <coughs> Uh, there's also so essentially what I would do is uh, you store the, the template uh, homomorphically, which is it's just going to get really boring for everybody who's not technical. But essentially, you're taking the template, which is it, a sort of uh, binary image of the eye, and you're storing that in a separate blockchain that's not linked to someone. And then you're encrypting it, and you're you're not allowing that encryption box to ever be opened. But you can run checks against that. But what stops someone? So what I'm saying is it's binary. Yeah. If it's already been used, you don't get to use it again. Right. And so let's say, so in the case where you've already created your ID and somebody takes a snapshot of your eye, which actually won't work, we don't have high resolution, high enough resolution of cameras unless they hold you down and use a very special camera at this point, but eventually that will probably develop anyway. But let's pretend that it was developed, okay? Uh, if you've already created your ID, they won't, it'll say, oh, it's, it's Boolean, it's yes or no. Does it exist already? Sorry, you can't use it again. And if they managed to do it before you create it, then we go back to the system we were just talking about then, which is somebody just stole my fucking eye. Yep. And uh, by the way, I actually own this eye. I don't know if you can check, but here you go. Look, oh, you, you own the eye, right? Reset, flag is dirty, go for it. Make sense? <coughs> we can talk about it more. Sure. Awesome. Anyone else? Question? Thank you for your time. <laughs>